All right. So Urban's first with Tamaguchi for hackers. Tamaguchi for hackers. This thing came, I, it came out just a few days ago, if that even, and it already surpassed its goal. This is basically a mix of the Wi-Fi pineapple and the Ponagachi in one on steroids. This thing can this thing is set to do quite a lot from RFID stuff to being a, a to security token to being a bad USB. Uh, has IR with it. it it's uh, if it shows up the way it is, it's going to be quite the quite the little beast. Can you, man in the middle, openers? <laughs> can you man in the middle cell phone calls with this thing? Because that's what we wanted to do, and it turned out that even after spending thousands of bucks, we still didn't have enough equipment to do it. Um, I don't know if it can. It, it does sub one gigahertz radio, so maybe not. We have the stuff to do it. Uh, the problem is, is that we're missing two cards for those SDRs. But uh, yep, yeah, that thing looks awesome. What it can do is spoof garage door openers. That's pretty neat. Yeah, among like um, uh, like TV, mm -hmm. IR stuff. It it That's has quite the capabilities. So yeah, I want one. That thing is awesome. Oh, it can sniff the garage door and duplicate it. Well, that's something. Yeah. But is that all? Pretend, uh, can mimic a card, an RFID reader. Signal analyzer, key lock. Oh, that's so you could probably duplicate a car opener then. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. That's a good find, Irvin. RFID. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. This wow. is oh, this is getting more interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this little thing packs quite the punch. U2F security token. U2F is the two-factor thing? Yes, the universal two-factor. You know, this thing sounds kind of like uh, there used to be universal remotes you would buy. Basically. And that is one of the things that it can do. Infrared learning. Holy cow. And open source, man. Open source firmware. It has a uh, um, GPIO pin so you can... Uh, add more modules to it. And so I guess the idea of this, now the way this works is you put in some money and then you get one when they make it? Yes. 129 or more. So do you get more if you offer more or is it just a donation or something? Uh, you can buy them in packs. Okay, so I see, I see. If you uh, donate this much, you get that. And this much, you get that, okay. Yeah. I've never done this Kickstarter stuff. Okay, I see, you buy a different number of them. All gone. Yeah, the ninety-nine dollar pledge is completely gone. How can you? They have a limit of something you're pledging. Don't they just make more if they get more money? Well, anyways, bad USB mode. Wow. Mm -hmm. This does sound like a pretty awesome gadget. Bluetooth. Holy cow. And NFC. Wow. Yeah. Sounds awesome. Okay. That's a good find indeed. Okay. And they were they were <laughs> they were looking for sixty thousand dollars and now they're up nine hundred and ninety-six thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Are you buying one? I think I will. Yeah, I haven't, but um, maybe I should. I don't know. Great. And then of course cracking Zoom passwords. Well, that's you know, I didn't understand this one because they said Zoom passwords are like six digit numbers and mine isn't, so I guess they've already updated or something. Uh, if I can pull up the uh, no. password, I have done something very bad. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> oh no! Uh -oh. Well, it looks like you're, you've done something to your face. <laughs> no. Um, okay. For some reason, that, that page is not loading for me. You probably have like too much security. Yeah, probably too much security. Uh, let me well, see. I see. Apparently, at some time, they were protected by six-digit numeric password. I never used Zoom passwords until they forced me to like two months ago. So I don't know what the, I did. Maybe they used anyway, to. Anyway, so yeah, there was a bug in Zoom where there was, um, you could essentially brute force your way into Zoom meetings yeah. uh, by w you, because there was a problem with the way that the CSRF tokens were working. Yeah. And so you can just crack into anyone's uh, meeting you want to. And I thought that would, that's a perfect story to share for our, our double weekly Zoom meetings. Yeah, yeah. I, know I made, uh, I, I reported a vulnerability and this company invited me to their private bug bounty program. And so the first thing I did was find part of their login with this flaw, write the script and try it and turn it in and say, dude, I can try like thousands of passwords until I get in. And they said, 
oh, tough. Somebody else already told us that we haven't bothered fixing it yet, which is all I ever get, which is like very annoying. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, that's one of the standard things to test. <laughs> is there some part of it? So anyway, this, this is a pretty thorough article about software supply chain attacks. And so I think it stands to be like a sort of a textbook. I might add it to uh, my cybersecurity responsibilities class or something. It really talks about it in a lot of detail. Um, and I like the list of uh, things that happen. It's just, they can mess, of course, they hijack updates and they undermine code signing. Apparent, you know, code signing ought to be the answer that you're like Android, your update must be signed with the same certificate used to sign the original app. That would seem like a strong defense, but apparently a ton of people have ways to get around that. A ton of products defeat code signing. So anyway, um, this is a really big issue. And I know there's even uh, startups and stuff. There are a company that will just track the source of all your software and then audit it and tell you what problems there are with it. It's, uh, we really need to get a handle on this. And I thought code signing was the hammer to squash it, but apparently not. Anyway, hmm. that's not a solved problem yet. And then the tracker networks, all right. Yeah, I thought this was a pretty interesting article. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of us know about these um, these uh, tracker uh, systems, but I thought it was uh, I thought it was interesting how they actually made a broke da breakdown of uh, of which um, Google, of course. Yeah, which companies they I, I thought it was interesting just to see them actually visualize the data of which companies uh, yeah. are. Uh, are doing this and doing it basically people. Google and nobody else Google and Facebook and oh, really nobody yeah. else worth a damn and notice Microsoft is nowhere which is the thing Microsoft is always taking the moral high ground here we don't read your email we don't snoop on you yeah 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 <laughs> well I thought one of them was interesting that was that Cloudflare is on that list um, yeah, yeah well, because Cloudflare does put cookies on your machine to, a, to have something to do with how it logs through the load balancer I wonder if that's a false positive it's a good Cloudflare gets blamed that for a lot of stuff that's not really their fault. Well, yeah, yeah, but that could be. That's a good point. Um, but I, I thought this was interesting and just, you know, I think one of the things that I like to uh, bring attention to um, is that, uh, you know, <laughs> these, we've talked about it before, but these companies, like, they can keep this data forever on you. Um, and sell it to other people. And they can sell it to other people and they buy it from, they buy data from other sources like, um, you know, what you buy, records of what you buy in the store, phone records, um, et cetera. And then aggregators combine that to build these like creepy comprehensive profiles on people. Um, one thing that I didn't really think about that, um, uh, that is uh, really interesting that, that this article made me consider uh, is that, um, these targeted ad systems can be used to uh, manipulate people um, as far as uh, political campaigns and stuff. And also, um, it, you know, they can be used in discriminatory ways where they don't show like certain ads to people, for example, for jobs or housing or whatever. Um, yep. Which is and pretty will show you a different price depending on yeah. your neighborhood and stuff. Yep. Yep. And uh, I, I think that I think that this is something that uh, can be and maybe is being used in some pretty uh, unsavory ways. So we need to be aware of it and um, you know try to take steps to mitigate it if we can, or at least like to put the word out there and yeah. educate more people about it. But on the other side, of course, all this targeted advertising is what pays for it. That's why everything's free. If you didn't have it, then you'd actually have to pay for service. Like Yeah, I mean that's how Google makes its money is off of our data. Yeah, and Facebook. And Twitter for that matter. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's useful to know about. Although I think the reason why nobody cares, like you know, Duck this is why DuckDuckGo exists, but the fact is almost nobody cares. I mean, they can tell you they have the trackers, but what they can't do is tell me exactly how did that hurt me today. What well, I and I, you know, I've been trying to acquire my data from these aggregators now for probably close to a year uh with with no luck i actually put in the requests to get my data um from from them and i yeah. you don't get anywhere 
Yep. Yep. Well, you know, that's right. I know there's a lot of targeted edge. It's not, I don't think it's doing me any harm, but, but um, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I would be, I, I might be willing to pay um, in order to do this, but then again, that's another, yet another uh, discriminatory uh, system that we're setting up for people. So well, if, you're poor, for if you're poor, if you're poor, that means that they can collect all your data and use well, it. Actually, the one thing I'd say is this is probably why Donald Trump is in there is because of Facebook's targeted ads. So they, in that case, it hurt me. Yeah. With voter suppression, which is what the stuff is used for. Yep. Yeah. All right. And so, uh, Here's the uh, attempt to do something about that, sort of. They had the... Uh... This was fun to watch. Oh, yeah, you watched it. Oh, good. Yeah, I watched par part of it with my students and the, the campers. Uh, it was definitely interesting to watch. Facebook got the most questions with Google second, um, Amazon third, and Apple fourth. It definitely looked like they were uh, using everything and anything against Facebook first. Because it, it really looks like they want to split Facebook up more than any any of the other three uh, with Google second. Apple, they only they only really hit Apple when it came to the App Store. Right. And, and the charging developers. Uh, yeah. But, well, you know, I Bezos listened. basically looked like he didn't know what he was talking about. Who did? Uh, Bezos. Oh. Yeah, when they asked him about what his company is doing, he basically answered, I don't know, each time. Oh, I remember that. Right. Oh, I'm not aware of what Amazon's doing. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. like what Bill Gates tried like 20 years ago, tried to say, oh, no, I don't know what my company does. You'd have to ask somebody else. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It but, was definitely, uh, it was interesting midway. Didn't see the whole thing, but it was, it was a, a good thing to watch and like talk with everyone else about. Yeah, the one thing I thought is interesting, I was just listening to Scott Galloway about it this morning. He said, what pe the people need to realize is breaking up these companies is not hurting them. It's making it better for everybody. Companies that got breakup for antitrust now compete and there's better products for cheaper, bigger market capitalization, bigger payout of the stock. The only person that loses is like that CEO who's now in charge of a company that's worth, you know, $100 billion instead of $200 billion. But... Um, the fact is, you know, not letting one. You know, when my grandma, when I was a kid, my grandma used to just, she was so mad about the fact that, uh, you know, originally uh, Bell Telephone was one big company, right. and then uh, they broke it up um, in the early '80s to be right. a, uh, a baby, baby Bell. Yeah, yeah, and uh, she used to get so mad about that, and I, I could never really understand why, because it actually made long distance cheaper. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so to me, the one that, that is harder to picture getting split up is Apple. Because Google, easy, split them up by the alphabet. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple, uh, Apple has a media cramp arm that could be split off. And they've got... Um, I think the one that would hurt Apple the most is if, they, if the government told them your entire chip making division becomes its own separate company. That's what Scott said. He said they should just remove their chip making division and make it separate. Um, I think you might want to break off their cloud business too. I can see ways to break them up. Yeah, because all the others make easy sense how to split. To me, like I think if they took out their chip making business, that that would seriously hurt Apple. Yeah, but I I think I, I, Apple has always protected themselves by not being a market dominator. That's why I was amazed when Steve Jobs Apple's brand was always we're the luxury brand that's only like five percent of the market you could just buy microsoft so we're never going to hit by any trust but then he actually wanted to dominate cell phones and he did they were they used to be like 70 percent of all cell phones but now they're down to like 10 percent of all the phones so i really don't think you can touch them with antitrust they're not the dominant player in any market segment you could just buy android or, or windows so i don't i think they're fine to just be a luxury brand but we'll yeah, see. Same with services. They're not dominating on any area of services either. Yeah, so I mean, they're not preventing competition. There's a cheaper alternative with a bigger company out there that most people prefer. So you can't say there's no competition. Right. Whereas Google and Facebook have just got a huge market and there's no competition at all. Right. Like if you want to put ads on the web, everybody, everybody I hear about the, the podcast now says, I hate Facebook. They're destroying the world, but I have to advertise on Facebook. If I didn't advertise on Facebook, I would go broke. There's no choice. You have to do it. And that's, that's when you need antitrust laws. 
Yeah. When there's just one player and they dominate so much that you're stuck with them, no matter how rotten they are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. I think it's all on the next election. I think the Republicans don't want to break any of it up. They just want to make sure that they don't censor like uh, lies about the virus and, and Nazi propaganda and, and stuff like that. They want to make sure all that gets through. They couldn't care less about the financial consequences of the monopoly. Oh, absolutely. That's all so, this is about. Yeah. So that's why I don't think until we have like a completely democratic administration that owns both houses and the White House, nobody's going to do anything to the tech companies because there's no agreement on what to do. The two different parties want to do opposite things. Right. Anyway, um, so that was, uh, I've lost my place. Caitlin's X. Caitlin's a oh, modulo bias. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, what's so modulo you, bias? So usually when you do random numbers in programming, you do this trick where you do the rand function and then modulo by the, the top value that you're looking for. Right. Right. And that's, but the problem is like, think about if you have an 8 bit value, so that's zero through 255 and you do something like modulo 244 or 254. That means all the numbers, from zero through uh, 253 are, you know, one to one. And then it, it flips over. So 254 and 255 are now counted as zero and one twice. So it's so not zero one. And, yeah. but, right. So zero and one now show up in your random um, uh, uh, values twice as often as the other numbers. Oh. And that's modulo bias. And I, I didn't even think about that as being important, but you can totally break encryption with it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. I know, they, RC4, this is why they break it. There is one value of RC4 that is like 0.01% more likely, and that's enough to ruin the whole thing. It, it has to be completely white. Exactly, so what they recommend wow. doing, and, and as a programmer, I, I think this is like ridiculous, but, but you're supposed to do this. You're, you're, you're supposed to just throw away numbers that aren't within your range. That would be better, sure. That, that, that's a very good point. Um, but of, of course, there's, there's always a small chance, as little as it may be, that you'll get a billion numbers all outside of your range. Um, however, there is, there is a way to, 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 to fix this, which is to, um, uh, or at least uh, make it less likely. You can, of course, if, you have, if you're doing like modulo 10, then you can you know, double that, essentially, and say, throw out any values between zero and uh, after 19 or something, or after you know, two, uh, 249. Yeah, I really like this. I ought to throw it in my crypto class. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is actually, this is great. I'd never thought about that before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that's just the standard way to, to do it via programming is to, like I said, do the rant and the modulo, but that create, that creates a statistical bias towards as the lower numbers. Um, yeah. And that's they have graphs and everything here you can look at. So good stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. a cool one. Yeah. All right. And so I, this was amazing. This one came out. It, it sort of confirms everything that you yeah. might have guessed, which is, you know, Trump said he stopped the testing and he told, they had a plan to make the tests. And then they figured out that the virus is spreading in democratic states and we should just let it spread to harm the democratic states. And that they turned off the testing. First, they bought a bunch of broken tests, which were just transported incorrectly and ruined in shipping. And then they had got the money to buy a lot of real tests, and then they carefully did not let anybody have them. That's why I think it explains one thing I watched, which Trump came out and said, I'm going to be in charge of this. I'm going to run the federal thing. And next week, it's like, no, I'm not going to do anything. The states have to run it. And this is what happened behind the scenes. They figured out that it was the blue states that had more of the virus. So you should just let them burn to damage the Democrats. It's, um, this is what you know, the, the incredible corruption of the Trump administration is just mind boggling. And the, the one that caught my attention last week was um, Fauci's going to throw out the baseball. So immediately Trump says, I'm going to throw out a baseball, which he totally wasn't and never set up. But he just is like a little kid. You got a toy. I got a better toy. I have to have a better toy right now. It's in, and what's amazing is how the entire Republican Party doesn't care about the fact that he is immature, disloyal, treasonous, and completely corrupt. They couldn't care less that he lacks, he's friends with Russia. He doesn't even protect our troops. He just that's the, part I don't, that, that's the part I don't get because I don't understand why, I don't understand why they wouldn't want to do some damage control at this point. Yeah. Uh, you know, because... 
I mean, there, there, there are good Republicans out there. Well, there I mean, used to be. I don't really think there are anymore. I think anybody who's still in the Republican Party has sold his soul to the devil. All the good ones left, like George Will and, and Morning Joe and stuff. I mean, how could you still be in the Republicans? It'd be like being a Nazi and saying, oh, I'm a good Nazi. I, I, just, I choose the brand. How could you possibly ally yourself with that brand anymore? Maybe they're I, I, just waiting for Trump to lose and then they'll disown him. No, but that's not happening. There's a whole ton coming after him. His son, the, that's Fox Tucker Harsland is going to run for president. Nikki Haley, he started a huge movement like the Tea Party movement. And there's a hundred imitators that just are going to do more of the same. They yeah, I don't, under, I, I, my, I, I don't understand it. it. Well, it has happened before in history. Um, you get these demagogues. It's happened many, happened in Rome and everywhere. It's just, it's amazing how 90% of the Republicans that used to claim to have values like balancing the budget and stuff were just completely lying. All they care about is power and money. And all that was just fake. I think it's true. Most like people are in a religion. You know, this is what, um, I think it was uh, the Dalai Lama or something came to America and he said, well, Americans don't really have religion because even if they say they have one, it doesn't affect their life. I mean, they say I'm in a religion. But all they mean is, you know, I'm, I'm in this yes. club, but I don't really understand or believe the tenets. Anyway, it's, um, it's just amazing. This blew my mind, though. I don't understand how this is a criminal. Well, I'm sure it is, but um, we're waiting for the election. But, you know, I think even after the election, that's why I'm increasingly thinking it's just time to leave America. We, we'll see. Even if, even if um, the Democrats win, this virus thing is going to be with us for three or four years. It's going to be nothing but remote education for a long time. I don't think uh, it's not entirely clear to me why I'm living in America instead of living someplace sensible like Canada or New Zealand. It's getting harder and harder to answer this question. I think unless you have like an extended family holding you here, it's not moral to just throw your life away living in a corrupt regime that is murdering its own people. <laughs> it's like suicide. Anyway, um, we'll see. Maybe it'll be more exciting after the next election, but I don't think so, because I think Biden, even if he gets in, he won't have enough majority to do things. He'll be held back by this um, people that hate science and hate logic and, and hate everything. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, in this case, while it might be, you know, we're, we're to the point where we have to pick the lesser of two evils, uh, and that's just the default setting. Like, you know, somebody made a comment, uh, that really resonated with me a week or two ago that was like, you know, how do we get to this point? What if, imagine if we had candidates running for president and, and the struggle in choosing was picking who was best because they're both really good. And you'd think that would be the case. <laughs> it's totally not. No, it's totally not. You know, I've, I've gone over the whole um, voting for the lesser of two evil things a long time ago. You're never going to have the perfect candidate. You're never going to have a candidate that's like, oh, I, I, I agree with them 90%, except maybe one or two things. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that you're always just the way statistical work, statist the way statistics work when you have a large number of people, you're going to have two candidates if you're in a two-party system where you're like, well, one of these are better than the other. I wouldn't, they're not my top choices, but whatever. And, and I've just learned to embrace that. It's not a bad thing to just vote for the lesser of two evils. Yeah, I, I'm, I actually pretty much agree with mainstream Democrats. I think Biden is that guy that will do 90% of what I want, really. I don't really need him to, like, push the extreme far left stuff. I think just an ordinary Democrat would be just fine, like Obama. <laughs> but I don't think that he can overcome the fact that 30% of Americans are completely insane. And they believe that witch doctors and magical alien sperm is infecting you and there is no coronavirus and that, you, and, that and that's, if that's what where you live, it's uh, there's no science. You know, if that's if that's what America really is, I don't think I belong in it anyway. And they're literally willing to sacrifice themselves. I mean, Herman Cain just died yesterday, who was a, a coronavirus denier, and they're and anxious to sacrifice all of us. Yeah, probably picked it up at that Trump rally. I mean, it's just it blows my mind. Well, it is, it is disturbing. I mean, it reminds me of the girl with the dragon tattoo. The guy wrote this story about Sweden, and he said, you know, in Sweden, we got like 20% real Nazis, like straight from 1940. They are still the Nazis, and they still believe that stuff, and they're still pushing it. And you have to like 
try and survive and steer around them. And basically we got the same thing here, significant portion of Nazis in the culture. It's, um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm gonna see what happens. There is no way to escape America now, so nothing can happen for the next couple of years. But uh, I think uh, definitely if Trump gets in again, I think the only thing to do is flee the country. It's basically like Hong Kong. Hong Kong people are fleeing. Obviously, if you care about freedom at all, you need to flee Hong Kong now because they're going to get crushed. They're being crushed. And the UK offered, everybody can just come in here. You can all become a UK citizen if you leave Hong Kong now. And I think it's basically the same in America. The house is burning down and you have to leave before it burns down. <laughs> no, anyway. It burns you with it. Yeah. Anyway, um, of course, I hear a few people saying, I'm going to heroically stay and fight back and save it. And I said, well, this is reminds me of a bad marriage, right? You're getting beaten, but you say, oh, no, I can fix it. And there's nobody can tell you when you've had enough and it's time to leave. The question is, some, you'll believe I can fix it. And certain people will say, I'm not going to fix it. I'm going to leave. There's not a right or wrong. It's just a judgment call. But, you know, I don't have much family ties holding here. And since I'm mainly a teacher, and apparently I'm not going to be able to teach face to face anytime soon, I could do everything of value from New Zealand <laughs> right now. That's what I've do though i do think uh I, I i read something somewhere about how you have to live in california to teach here um but i i haven't confirmed that that's accurate yet yeah well, i know uh you could just get like a rent a room or, or get a p.o box or something and there you go yeah yeah well you know uh the um the fantastic organization and valuable uh, contribution of the administration at the college is not really that seductive that I can't possibly <laughs> imagine continuing a career without the glorious contribution of the college administration. <laughs> That's their, they're sort of following suit with the way the rest of the country is going right now, which is like rape, pillage and burn it down. They are. So, you know, even if I had to like move to a different college to teach, I don't see that as an outrageous thing. <laughs> You could totally teach in New Zealand. They just want you to have a PhD there, so. Well, I do. <laughs> Although they might get sore about it being in the wrong field. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I imagine that when, if Biden gets in and he gets all three houses and they actually like reverse everything Trump did, then I might feel better about America for a while, but I'm, uh, I'm very disturbed by what America's turned into. Anyway, um, so the D-Bold got jackpotted. This sounds uh, awesome. It is awesome uh, <laughs> because um, <laughs> it's awesome on many levels. I really actually like this article a lot because they're talking about how they uh, managed to do it. And um, some of the ways <laughs> are like totally stupid and you would have thought they would have figured out how to mitigate against them. Um, my favorite of the methods was uh, how they were um, – USB terminal. What is a USB terminal? Uh, well, they have USB inputs on these machines. Now they're hidden behind a facade. Exactly. <laughs> they're hidden behind a facade that you can like rip off. This is what Barnaby it. Jack did like 10 years ago at DEF CON. I know. You would have thought <laughs> they would have learned their lesson. And then one of the other ways they were doing it was through phishing Diebold's, or uh, phishing, uh, the employees of uh, companies that have the ATMs on site and then getting them to install malware on it that would uh, allow attackers to access the admin panels later. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome. And, and one of the other things that got me was down at the bottom where they were giving mitigation tips. Uh, there, one of them was like, oh, they should they should use encrypted hard disks. And I'm like, they weren't already? No. Yeah, they uh, don't, yeah, they don't use encrypted hard drives. You can just boot to a Linux or something and get in. This is like hacking was 20 years ago, like hacking into Windows 95. Right, and our banks are just, they just don't give a shit. They're so far behind, you know? And I, I <laughs> it's really, it's really mind boggling to me, you know? And so I how mean- much money did you really get to steal? Yeah, exactly. By 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 uh, banking fraud standards, the money that's in an ATM is small potatoes. But uh, yeah, but still, this is nuts. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, well, you know, it's kind of what you would think. I remember I, I always tell my friends, don't use those little ATM machines in the gas station. Those look like toys. I say, man, you know, that is just like $50 of, of a router 20 years out of date connected to a cash drawer. <laughs> and teenagers often hack into those things because all you have to do is like unplug them and plug them in and then put in the default password or something stupid. Like, Anyway. Those are the ones that we had at CPTC last year. Where the, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I was trying to get one for the college, but I guess it's good that I didn't since we're not going back in, uh, not well, going back into school. But yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's just yeah. mind boggling to me that the banking industry seems to really not care. Well, to be fair, uh, like you say, they look at big losses. And I mean, they accept half of a percent of every transaction is lost from credit card fraud. So I'm sure, you know, until like, you know, half of the ATMs are getting hacked into, they really won't care. They're just right. all money with them. I mean, how much do we lose? How much would the mitigation cost? Yeah, but it's got to add up. I mean, it's, it's crazy to me, uh, you know, the way, like the thing that happened to my parents a year or two ago where somebody made like fraudulent charges uh on a card and i mean they've also been hit through um uh wells fargo where people stole like twenty thirty thousand dollars and turned it into gold uh, bought gold with it and they could totally catch the people i could figure out who to go after with some basic like five minutes of osint but the bank doesn't care because it's just 20 or 30 grand. And I'm like, if this is happening over and over and over, and it's like, you know, that's got to add up. And then, you know, we hit uh, economic crises and they're like, oh, we need money. We need this, we need this bailout money. You've got to bail us out uh, yeah. while we're re reporting record profits. Uh, you know, I, it just doesn't sit well with me. Yeah. You know, one thing I saw like about a year ago, they switched the cards to like, chip instead of the mag swipe and one of my students brought in a video on hacking class and said there's a new vulnerability it used to be you put in your card the atm eats your card you get your money then you get your card back but the new one you swipe your card you're logged in and you can just walk away and it's still logged in and the next customer can just come up and get more money it doesn't automatically log out when you because it doesn't eat your card and give it back it is, so it's like a really common vulnerability. This used to happen all the time to teachers at the college. They would leave the machine logged into their Gmail and go on, and then somebody else gets in their Gmail. And the ATM was working like that. So, I mean, there's just a lot of, you know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Yeah. So you just have to have a, an endless series of updates for these things. But that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. And then I got... Yeah, to, it's uh, quite a cascade of failures. <laughs> What's that? It's quite the cascade of failures. Oh, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. So let's hear about summer camp. I'm glad you wrote a page up so people can read yeah. about it. Uh, so summer camp today is the final day of all summer camps. I am done with them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been at it since uh, since the, the COVID thing struck. And I kind of wrote up a little bit of the adventure. What um, is guacamole? I've heard of guacamole, but I don't Apache know. Apache guacamole is how you can uh, get the, the desktop over the browser. Oh, so it's like remote desktop. Yes, it's remote desktop, but through the browser. I use a Google Chrome Great. desktop. It's pretty much the same thing, right? Um, no. Pretty much the same with the difference that with Google Chrome desktop, you had to install an extension on your browser. With Apache guacamole, you don't. Oh, okay. That's cool. They've yeah. been using it for CCDC for the last couple of years, and it's been a real upgrade. Um, NetLab uses it, and yeah. so does TriHackMe and a bunch of other uh, users. Oh. It's free. Uh, so I basically put, put down the main items that we use to run the camp because we went 100% online and, uh, and what we used in order to make this happen. And I realized after the fact that we actually made a multi-cloud infrastructure because we used GCP to host the machines that the students would use. Mm -hmm. We use DigitalOcean to run our capture the flags and anything static. And by using Discord, we're using uh, Cloudflare and Zoom. Yeah. So we were basically running on four different clouds to run the camps. And I mean, they were so successful that Sacramento and uh, the North Far North copied us. 
No, this sounds great. And so they were all doing like challenges like the ones I saw at Cyber Patriot, right? They're securing machines and stuff. Oh, no, no, no. We, I, uh, ever since uh, Richard Grodigan gave me the reins, I've taken this above and beyond. So we introduced them to Python. We did Linux. We did networking. We did Wireshark. We did cryptography. Uh, we did digital forensics. We did uh, 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 the juice shop. Yeah. And, and so they're getting, they're finding flags and getting on scoreboards and stuff. Yep. Yep. But each and one of these activities having various, various things with them and, and tons of capture the flags. Yeah. We went above and beyond the just securing a simple computer. Uh, the, the main goal was to really show students the realm of cybersecurity and, and hopefully get them interested into our realm. Yeah. It sounds great. They were doing Splunk too, right? Yep. They yeah. They did Splunk. Process. They did Juice Shop. They did a digital forensics case. They're doing um, the final capture the flag, uh, not capture the flag, uh, King of the Hill from Try Hack Me. Oh, so great. We're, you know, we're showing them everything from defense to offense. That sounds great. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear it. So uh, you got, you're funded by some grant, right? Is it going to keep right. we're fun We're funded by the Strong Workforce Grant that's uh, for the community colleges. Good. And, and you're, all, now you're all, letting in community yeah. college students in addition to high school students, right? Yeah, yeah. This covered the, the entire gamut. We ended up serving, I did the math earlier today, we served uh, 1,500 students. Yeah, well, I'm sure a ton of our students would like to do this. It filled yeah. up early, right? I mean, by the time... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it filled up early. Mm -hmm. uh, for next year, we're actually going to make three camps instead of yeah. two. Good. With ways for students to test in and out. Um, and yeah, it'll be, it'll be bigger, assuming, well, now, now knowing that we can do it and we pulled it off and uh, credit to you, Sam, because the, the whole reason, one of the big reasons it worked was your guidance of using GCP and DigitalOcean. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad it worked. You know, yeah. uh, I, I used and abused the credit system of GCP. Good. So we, the biggest expense uh, was not there because we just ran, we just ran with credits. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and now, now what? If I were you, I would call Amazon and say, "Dude, I just promoted Google, and if you would give me a ton of free stuff, I'd move it to Amazon." Yep, <laughs> that's yep. what you do, because <laughs> it would be better for them to learn how to use Amazon or Azure, God forbid. But if right. they would give it to you free, <laughs> you could move them on that. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. That sounds it awesome. Was, I, I'm sure all my students want to do it. So I hope it increases and more slots become available. Yep. Yep. Well, we'll be able to do it. And there's already talk for next year to do it both online and on site. If, you know, if we're able to be on site uh, yep. by next year's time. But now, now that the gamble paid off and it all worked, I can have another big group of teachers again so we can have more camps running simultaneously and serve more students at once. That sounds great. But we'll see if we can have any face-to-face -face anytime soon. I mean, it seems to me like there's going to be absolutely nothing done to stop the virus until January because the Republicans won't refuse to do anything. And by then, we'll have such an epidemic, it'll take probably about a year to clear it. So I right. would think we're in for about another three semesters of nothing but online, right? at the very least. Unless yeah. it just mutates and vanishes of its own accord, which is what happened in 1917 or 1918. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. The first, uh, the first like confirmed dog uh, case, the death oh, was, yesterday, which was a bummer. Um, I've read statistics anywhere between uh, a year and ten years. Yeah, well, well, the other one never went away. It just became less lethal and became the H one N one flu. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, nobody knows what happened. I'm just this is we. It's amazing how America is just. You might as well have been in the Middle Ages. We just did absolutely nothing. We're just letting it rip through the culture. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the world is horrified. I saw a nice New York Times article where they took a news summary and they played it to people in like other nations and they couldn't believe it. They saw the mass graves in New York City and like the Japanese woman was crying and there was a guy there from like a third world country saying, we got it conquered here. This was like... A third world, we defeated in a third world country. How is it that America can't deal with this? And that's a good question. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. When when the Korean uh, lady burst into tears. Yeah. I, I I burst into tears too. I mean, it was yeah. it was really sad. Well, it was it was really very sweet that she's so compassionate. But you know, I was just it was 
it's just, it's just, it's amazing how the Republicans are exactly the opposite. I remember I used to say Reagan had the big lie, but Trump was bigger. He said, he's going to make us great again and make us the envy of the world again. And he has made us the, the horror story of the world where they're all like disgusted at what's wrong with us. And we seem to be the worst nation in the world. And you have to like close their borders and not let those filthy Americans in because they're crazy over there, which is apparently true. I can't, can't blame them. I can't blame them at all. I wouldn't let us in either. It's like, like uh, that was Mark Twain. He said, I would never join a club that would have me as a member. Anyway, um, so this was awesome. I saw this one and I saw you found one too. Homomorphic encryption. I've right. been waiting for this. This right. is like black magic. <laughs> it is black magic. So the idea is, so they don't go into details, obviously, because this is still proprietary for IBM. So I don't know exactly how they're doing oh, it's it. Open source, but it is it is supposedly going to be open source. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's for Linux. I don't know if it's open source. Um, no. Okay. Well, I'm hoping I can get it and put it yeah. in my crypto class because this is awesome. <laughs> right. Uh, but but the idea is that you can have data that's encrypted, do operations on that encrypted data, yeah. and not have it decrypted anywhere in that process. Yeah. So it completely I, stays encrypted all the time. I've been hearing ads for this for a year, but yeah. I kind of discounted it because the early versions of this, as you can imagine, were like a thousand times bigger and slower than normal encryption because that's kind of insane. But apparently yeah. they've got some version of it down to practical use. Yeah, yeah. So now, so IBM is, so now they have it in practical use. Um, and then another thing that this mentions, uh, let me see, I can't find the article. AMD has some extensions for their um, CPU that does something very similar to uh, homomorphic encryption. There it is, yeah. The secure mm -hmm. encrypted virtualization, where you have a virtual machine where all the memory in that virtual machine is encrypted, and it does all the operations and stuff in that virtual machine. And to the outside, you can't see what's going on. Yeah. Well, you know, this would stop things like the target hack, where they stole yeah. the credit card numbers out of the RAM in the payment terminals. You know, if you could actually do it, without having to pay like 10 times as much for the hardware. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and, and if you were to shrink that down instead of going to making a VM that's like Windows, you know, 10 and taking up like 10 gigs or whatever, but if you make a small little OS VM to like do credit card operations. Oh, but it and, does take 50 times the CPU and 20 times the RAM. Right, but that's nothing. And well, in, in computing power time, I mean, if you're doing encryption, 40 or 50 times the, the computing power is one nano, you know, 10 nanoseconds versus, you know, 100 nanoseconds. You know, it's, it's not, it, it's practical. You can do it now. Well, it, it reminds me of Rust. I mean, Rust is memory safe, but it seems to be about 100 times slower. So yeah. uh, you need, you, you know, what you need to do, you clearly couldn't afford to use it for everything. You'd have to choose like the certain critical actions and right. put them in the system and let the rest of it run on the old system, but still. Right. Yeah, but for like I said, 40, 50 times. I mean, that's a that's a, a O of N type uh, expansion, not a N squared expansion of, of operations. So that's right. That's right. Yeah, that yeah. that means uh, there'll be an application for it. Absolutely. And, uh, I got. I totally like to make a project where people start playing with it. Anyway, and so then um, I've been hearing a lot about voter registration and and turnout, all kinds of different things. But um, this one surprised me. More than half of the young people don't understand how registration works or where to do it or anything. They're not ready to vote by mail, um, which is the general case with young people. It's very hard to get young people to vote because of course I remember they're busy with school and, and dating and parties and everything. And they voting just seems to be pointless and useless to them because it doesn't really benefit them right away. And so uh, most of them don't really know how to register or what to do. Uh, so voter suppression is very effective on them. A lot of them are very, are to the point too where they're just apathetic about it because they think it doesn't matter. Um, especially, and I, and I can see how they might think that with the last outcome. And that is how voter suppression works. They want you to be discouraged and not bother and see it as useless. Then, yep. and anyway, so um, there's this here's the article I heard which caught my attention, which said that the number of registered voters has gone down by as much as seventy five percent now that you can't do it face to face and you never go to like the DMV or anything where it would be. Uh, but on, then this one surprised me. They said the Democrats are pulling ahead. 
So I guess even at those depressed numbers, it's depressing the Republicans more than Democrats in at least some cities. Now, the one thing that's missed here, which is the number one mistake, I think people, people see national polls. National polls mean absolutely nothing because of our electoral college system. It doesn't, if, you, if 90% of Californians do something, it doesn't mean anything. All that matters is like three states. And really only certain counties in those states totally determine which party will win. So that's all that matters. The rest of us should not be included in the total to find out uh, what's going to happen. It is uh, our strength. Did, uh, did Trump back off on his uh, push to delay the election once he realized the Speaker of the House would be president? If uh... Oh, I don't think he realizes anything of the sort, and I don't think it's true. I think Bill Barr has made it very clear that there's a strong movement in the Republican Party for the powerful president that can just do anything. Trump has said repeatedly, I can do anything. My power is absolute. And if I do anything that makes it legal, and Bill Barr totally agrees with it, and there's in fact a whole bunch of Republican political theorists. I listened to some podcasts from college teachers, and they pretty much went along with this. They said the president really should have just absolute power. So it's not clear at all that he can't do it. Um, he can the basically college, do anything. College the college teachers said the president should have absolute power? Yeah, it's a belief. Uh, they call it uh, the unitary president or something. It's a, uh, it's a political theory that the president should have essentially absolute power. And I think, for example, what Abraham Lincoln did during the Civil War was absolutely blatantly unconstitutional. It's not like there's a clear line of what a president can do and what they can't do. They can sort of do anything they can get away with. And in theory, you can impeach them. But in fact, that has never worked, ever. The only thing you can do is vote them out if you don't like it. Um, so, I mean, we'll see. I mean, the fact now it appears that the Republicans are not going to go along with it, and therefore he can't do it. But I don't think the actual letter of the law matters at all. I mean, he's totally ignored subpoenas. He's totally broken the law right and left. It's clear that the Constitution and the laws are not holding him back at all. It's just when the Republicans actually no longer go along with him, then that will stop him. A, a few months ago, it was so funny because Biden – uh, said, uh, just mark my word, Trump's going to try to delay the elections. And the right wing and everyone who doesn't like Biden were laughing at him and calling him a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> and uh, um, here we are. Uh, oh, yeah. And three, two years ago, my friend said Trump would refuse to leave office if he lost. And I said, oh, no, it couldn't come to that. And I've had to change my mind about that. That does appear to be the case. Yeah, he's definitely setting up a... Uh, to to claim that you know that the election wasn't fair and to contest the results and everything. So yeah, we've got a, a real constitutional crisis, and I mean I, I hear a lot about the Nixon. You know Nixon, the Republicans came to him and said, "Dude, you're destroying the party. This is terrible. You have to drop out." You know he, the Republicans were not willing to just follow him over a cliff, but now they are. Right. Something has right. happened That's to Republicans. They've lost all their patriotism, and I don't quite know why. That's what I'm, that's what I was saying earlier. I just, I really don't get why they don't want to do some damage control at this point. And I, as far as, you know, one thing I want to comment, I wanted to make about what you're saying that there's a contingent of people that think that the president should have absolute power. Like that's completely antithetical to me because at least what I was always taught in school, obviously not necessarily the case in the real world, but uh, was that, uh, you know, our, our government's predicated on this uh, system of checks and balances. So, I mean, how that just seems completely antithetical to. Yes, but if you listen our, to these guys and it's Bill Barr has written articles about it and he said his theory is the president should be allowed to do anything he wants. And the only thing you can do if you don't like it is vote him out. And all the rest of the Government should just line up behind him and obey him like a king. That's there. There's a Bill Barr is the champion of this, and so is I think the guy he put on the Supreme Court, um, the guy with the beer, Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. Oh yes, yeah, he's Kavanaugh. also a champion of this. This it's a established theory that the president should basically have essentially unlimited power, and everybody else is just a servant of the president because he was elected. And if these people don't like it, they can vote against him. The part where he can cancel the election and just stay in, though, that I think is above even this theory. And that's why some Republicans are at least pretending to oppose that. I don't know if they would actually not go along with it. And quite a few of them have been very vague in saying, well, maybe he can just put off the election. That might be all right. I don't really know. Um, we'll see. Anyway, it's, it's interesting times. It's a constitutional crisis in America for what it's worth. It, it makes interesting stuff to study. 
But anyway, then you got uh, hackers hiding fake news stories. That's what we need. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> yes, and that's what we got. So, uh, you know, actually none of this came as a surprise to me. Uh, it was, it didn't surprise me at all, actually. Uh, and FireEye, I guess, put out a paper um, recently regarding this. Uh, and it's not, um, this, this story doesn't necessarily relate to um, uh, this country, what we're doing here, but uh, it was in Eastern Europe, uh, the mm -hmm. where the story uh, focuses on. And uh, essentially what they did was uh, this company, Ghost, Ghost Rider, Mm -hmm. um, or syndicate, hacking syndicate, uh, uh, seeded these, these real news sites like the, well, like say, for example, the, um, Belarusian, uh, um, equivalent of Newsweek or whatever with these fake stories that, uh, had a real, um, anti United States and anti NATO, uh, slant and, uh, it was very effective. Um, yeah. And uh, they, they said, well, we're stopping one step short of saying that it was Russian hackers, but yeah. it was totally Russian hackers. Yeah, <laughs> that's the way you always are with attribution. Like we can't, we can't concretely tie it to Russia at this time, but it's certainly in line with their interests. Yeah, I didn't know, see, now in America, you don't need to hack the news agencies. You just put it on the, the, the eight ones that cooperate with Russia, like, right. like Fox News and Breitbart. And then you just put it on Facebook. You don't actually need to reach a reputable platform because nobody trusts the platforms anymore anyway. Right. Well, they're taking it to the next level. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. And this well, information is warfare. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's certainly interesting to see how it goes, and and we'll see what comes of it all. Well, anyway, that's good stuff. Any more comments? Yeah, I went to my office to basically clean it out since. Oh yeah. Stuck. And and I have a little a little piece of Sam that that I'll frame one day. Uh, have you ever? Oh yeah, See, that thing. Yeah, that book that, that I never that thing, got. Uh, it it is whoop, it is autographed by Sam himself. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> that book. But um, there may be an update. Those guys, in fact, are signed a contract with me to make update of the videos, and maybe they'll make a book again because you know they made that book without even even telling me, and I don't even know what's in it. But <laughs> uh, but now I people think I'm respectable because I have a book, and I say, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, I got a book. Uh, well, I I got the one signed copy, so yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to update the videos and make more videos, and maybe they'll make another book without telling me and, and put my name on it without telling me again. That's why I thought I'd never do anything with those guys again, but then the coronavirus hit, and I said, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't be saying no to clients, even annoying clients. Um, <laughs> we'll see if I go. All right. Well, I guess I'll stop the recording. And... Uh,